Good Friday, everyone. Welcome to the VolQuest.com podcast with Rob Lewis, Jesse Simonton, and Austin Price. I'm Brent Hubbs. Glad to have you along with us on this Friday. Tennessee takes on Georgia tomorrow. Million dollar question is what is Tennessee going to do at the quarterback position? Jeremy Pruitt has been coy all week. He said on Monday, uh, not going to give Georgia any secrets, not going to give a game plan away, whatever. Um, reiterated the same thing on, on Wednesday. What, what do we think? Going to play two? What, what, what do we think is going to happen here? I think it's going to be Brian Maurer. I mean, based off of you know everything that's went on when even when we've been out there, you can tell that you know they put Maurer on the accelerated rate. Um, Jesse, you know, this has been Jim Cheney, you know, coaching him to do you know similar stuff out of the shotgun, out, out of under center, just different looks. I mean, he spent extra time with him, and I think when we've left, Maurer's gotten a majority of the work uh, with the ones. Yeah, what I mean, think? all signs point to eighteen. Now, now, did they stick with them? Because Tuesday, because Tuesday, we kind of felt like, yeah, JG made the most sense. Play both of them. Yeah, but then you started hearing some stuff kind of behind the scenes a little bit, and then you go out there Wednesday, and you're like, man, this looks different, and this seems different because you know, AP and I made sure that we kind of watched Jim Cheney the whole time when we were out there, uh, and it certainly, you know, I think they're going to keep it coy all the way up right until you know kickoff, but. As we sit here, you know, 24 hours before the game, I, I think, you know, my, my, my bet is is at 18, you know, he's going to get his first start against the number three team in the country. Rob, I felt like that that they were going to play two all the way at some point. Two, two quarterbacks, not, not just number two. Two quarterbacks all the way at, in the game. I still think they'll end up being multiple quarterbacks playing in the game. No, you, I kind of agree with that. What do you think? I mean – I, I, I lean towards that. I mean, I, I thought that was what it was going to be. I thought it was going to be Jarrett would start, and then they'd have a plan to play Mauer. Now, I mean, I, I think we're all hearing the same kind of thing. I mean, it kind of feels like Mauer's going to get the start. I mean, I think I think whether or not they play two to – if Mauer starts, I think it totally depends on how the Maurer game goes. does. Yeah, I mean, I think if he's doing okay and having success, I think they give it to him. I think if he struggles a little bit, then, then you'll see another one. Now, the bigger question to me is, I mean, do you see Shrout or, or, or Jarrett? I mean – because if you don't see Jared in a relief role, then he you got to think he's done. I You know, I, I lean the other way, Brent. I, I, if you're going to start 18, I think you give him every opportunity unless you're going to play the other young quarterback, which is what Jesse suggested in that piece last week. I, I don't – I just yeah, – to me, it would have to be really dire to go back towards JG. If you – if you, it was one thing to pull him and then put him back in at Florida, but if he doesn't start this next game, uh, to me it's hard to go back to him unless – there's an injury and you're in the football game. I mean, there are situations where you could go back to him, but I, I think you ride with 18 if you're going to start him on Saturday. So let's say they go that direction, and, and it is and it is 18. What does this offense look like? Because it's got to be different. I mean, or is this now check with me? Because you've got to help a young quarterback. Because if, if it's him, if he thought it was fast at Florida, he's not seen fast to what he's going to see to start of this game uh, you know, tomorrow night. So, if that's the direction they go, what does this offense look like now? Uh, I'm pulling up my piece here to just to have the exact stat here. I mean, part of it is it, it's going to, it's going to have to look different, also just schematically, because I think it's he's only taken three snaps under center in in the work that he's had in two games in so, his life. Yeah, and he and that was before <laughs> he had never done that. In high school, so I mean, obviously that's away. a little bit of a joke because he does it a lot in practice. But I mean, the right? In a game, he's not. In yeah. a game, you're, so the likelihood is it's going to be some less twelve personnel. You're going to go more spread. I think obviously the QB run has to be involved because that's clearly if you're going to play him, that's one of his strengths: his ability to kind of move around. You're probably going to move the pocket a little bit more. Now that there's come, there's some dangers with that, as we know, because if you if you flood the side to one side, you're making the read easier for the quarterback. But you're also cutting down the available options, and, and, it, and it, you can kind of simplify it for the defense. Uh, but the, but the, the most consistent offensive group through four games has been the tight ends. Yeah. Which you're, gonna, which you're saying under that scenario. They may be shelving, you, they you, may be you're, shelving you're them not, a bit. You're not playing with the, with the group of guys that's given you basically your best chance in the run game. And, and the group that's been the most consistent in, in terms of being effective for Now, you. you can still go 12 personnel in the gun. It's just but teams are less likely to do that. But they, they could go that avenue still if that's, if that's you know, the way they think they can still get the best success, especially if they incorporate QB power and some speed options. 
Well, I think we all agree, Rob, they've got to be able to run the football oh. somehow. Now, look, you're not going to line up and – I think, what's Georgia giving up, 50-something 50 50 yards? 57 yards a game. But you're not going to line up and run against them and have great success. But you've got to somewhat keep them honest. You I mean, can't it, throw it 11 times in a row. Yeah, you can't throw it 45 times with a true freshman quarterback. Uh, I mean, or with any quarterback on this roster. I mean, you're asking – I mean, you're, you're inviting disaster if that happens. And I just – I mean – you got to slow the game down. I'll be stunned if Tennessee has much success on the ground. I mean, that would shock me. I'd well, I, I, I'm with you, I think, but I do think you have to call it. I think you've got to try to have some success. Oh, sure. Which I think when you look at, with the exception of the BYU game, where they lost complete faith in Jared in the second half and they ran it all the time, they got away from the run against Georgia State. They, they got away from the run in the second half against Chattanooga when they were playing multiple quarterbacks. No big deal. Game was in hand there. And they got away from the run in the Florida game, I thought. Oh, they absolutely did. It, it, yeah. it looked at, it gets far like they went in just thinking they couldn't run it. So basically, if you take Chattanooga off the board, the three other games, at no point have they been balanced. They've either been super pass heavy or the second half against BYU where they were run heavy. And so anytime you're not balanced, it, to me, it makes things harder, especially on a quarterback that's a, a struggle. Well, and it's, I mean, we'd say it every week. You, you got to win first down, you got to win first down. Maybe there's no greater, I mean, you, if, if this guy's in third, whoever the quarterback is, but particularly if it's if it's Maurer, and he's in third and long all day, you got a bad night of football ahead of you. And most, I mean, look, I don't think any of us are going to be picking Tennessee to keep this thing real close against Georgia, but you, you got a bad night of football ahead of you if you're in third and nine, third and ten all I, night long. I think, I think the hope for Tennessee, if if you if they turn the keys over to Maurer, is that it kind of looks like what Ole Miss and Alabama look like. Now the final score did not obviously look great, but Ole Miss was able to move the football a little bit because they let their freshman quarterback kind of run around, make some playground plays, and then they also just let him run a lot. Now he may get you're going to take some pounding, and it's going to hurt you know Sunday and Monday, uh, but it does keep the offense on the field. <coughs> it does move the chains. And, and it does change the scoreboard a little bit where maybe you can score some points even if you're going to give up a million that perhaps against the Mississippi States and the South Carolinas you feel like you have a better shot because you're like, all right, we kind of found something here. Now, I'm not saying that's what's going to happen, but that's how Ole Miss walked out of the Alabama game where they're like, well, we scored 24 points. We felt, you know, we've, maybe, maybe this little freshman that can run around and do some stuff. Maybe well, similar to what South Carolina felt when they walked out of the Alabama game too. Well, I mean, yeah. <laughs> and in reality, I mean – what he's going to face Saturday, you know, when he, when he, you know, if, if you make him the start Saturday and he plays, and, and I honestly think he's going to force some balls because I think that's who Maurer is, which means I think that some of those receivers are going to make some plays for him because they're going to be given an opportunity to go get it, but he's also going to make some mistakes, and, and that's just going to be natural. But a week from now as to what Jesse's saying, don't you think the game, I mean, you come out there and you start playing, you know, you're playing a video game, you're playing on the toughest level, right out of the gate, and then you take it down a level, it's going to be a little easier a week from now against Mississippi State. Because even if those suspended guys do play, he's seen live action against the number three team in the country. Well, you would hope, but you, just, you don't yeah, know how Yeah, this is all hypothetical. This is all hypothetical. And you don't have any – I mean, everybody thought that Jared would be better this year too because right. he played a full year last year and, and saw everything at full speed. And, and, and Mauer's the guy who's got completed a, 30% and got a $5 million dollar offensive coordinator. Right and, got a, right, and got a $5 million dollar offensive coordinator making plays. And, and he's a guy who's forced to – he's done he's forced more footballs in four games than he's forced it in his entire career, Jared has, which is why we're at this point of having discussion and thoughts of playing a, a freshman quarterback against Georgia on, on Saturday night. He's got to have help around him. You mentioned the wide receivers. I'm with you. got to give him chances. Throw some jump balls. Let them go. Let them go. Try to make some plays. Get it out of your hands yeah. fast. I, I, Especially since Georgia, that's where Georgia's banged up. Right, they're a little banged you, up in the second. And you, and you go back to the, the Cedric Tillman pass at Florida. I mean, it wasn't far off from being a touchdown. Now, granted, he threw that thing in, <laughs> in the triple coverage. Should have been picked. But if you watch it in slow mo- slow motion, I mean, the ball placement wasn't bad for the throw. So yeah, I mean, again, he's going to give them some chances. But you know, I, I think ultimately that's all these guys want. I mean. The, Jawan's been getting his, but I think Callaway ultimately just wants a chance. Give me a chance to go get it. And if, if somebody, well, Callaway's got to beat man coverage yeah. too. I mean, I, I think that's, yeah, that that so, has some of that's a little bit on him. I mean, yeah, he, he I can mean, be that, mad in now, the Florida game all he wants to, but he was blanketed all that. Yeah, now it, well, it was not his fault on that interception. He made the right read on the cover right. too. But uh, at other times, sometimes it's you got to beat your man one on one too. So, and a storyline that's been the Tennessee Florida series for the last fifteen years is beating man coverage. He's also got to have help up front. 
Darnell right back to right tackle. Fourth combination. Riley Locklear to right guard. Is that Tennessee's is, – is, are we to the point that's Tennessee's best five? Mm -hmm. After all the experimenting, that's where Tennessee lands. That's their, that's their best five. One Jay's at left tackle. Left guard's Trey. Kennedy's the center. Locklear's the right guard. Darnell Wright's right tackle. Is I, that their best five? I'm going to say no because I still think based off of play, when he's played, Jameer Johnson should be in the five. Now, I understand that he's coming off the knee scope or whatever. So, I don't want to say until he gets back – no, it's not. Now, maybe those guys, their play elevates to the point where they pass him by. But to this point, I can't say they have. Um, you know, I, that, that's just my opinion. I think if you have him in the five, then maybe it's their best five. Your, your thoughts? I, I am surprised that they've abandoned the Calvert experiment so quickly. Just because in terms of where they're at in the season one and three. I mean, how do you go from everybody not else? Every, if to not it's kind of funny every, if every fan's advocating for the backup quarterback because why, let's see what you have. Let's, you know. And and there is some real upside with Calvert. Now, he has not been particularly sharp in the two games. I know he's a little bit dinged up, too. He did get some work this week with the ones in replace of Darnell. I would not be surprised if, if maybe they it goes two series Darnell, one series Calvert. You know, it's kind of a break, especially if it's as, if it's hot, if it's as hot as it's been. But they seem to like Locklear at guard. It, it at least makes more sense to stick Darnell just at one spot. So if they've decided that's, you know, I, I think we're both in agreement that it doesn't make sense to play the freshman at guard, and then if you don't like that, put him out to tackle and then bring him back in at guard. <laughs> Three weeks ago, Rob, coming out of the BYU game, there was, there was lamenting of the lack of physicality at the right guard spot with Ryan Johnson and Riley Locklear, and now Riley Locklear's appears to be the starting right guard. They've yeah. just had a hard time figuring out, I'm, finding five and figuring out who the five are. I'm with you. I mean, and just you know, three weeks ago, they didn't they didn't think Darnell Wright was a tackle. Now now he is a tackle. And and, and I, I'm with Jesse on the Calvary experience. I just, I mean, if you're making as much money as these guys are making to coach, I mean, look at the physical dimensions of this kid and Locklear I mean, and, and get, you know, get something out of him. I mean, I, did, I didn't think k played well at Florida. I mean, I'm not, I'm not pitching a fit about him getting out of the starting lineup, but I mean, Riley Lockley just played quite a bit of football right here. I mean, I think you know what you got there. He made the war daddy board, though. Now, football. he has been, I will say this in, in Lockler's defense, he's been better. He's been better. I, I think he's been uh, better than, than, many, than maybe some fans, you know, would think. Like, the staff is, is, clearly, is clearly pretty high on it's him. It's an all-country roads right well, side. I mean, he, West it Virginia, is. it is. <laughs> but, and look, I, I'm not knocking on the guy. I just think it's interesting that it, he wasn't basically wasn't good enough coming out of, and maybe they just took the Chattanooga game, which is a, ironic considering this is how they took the Georgia State game and said, "Hey, we're we're going to experiment with this on the right side and see if it works." And they liked it well enough to start with it that way at Florida, but it, it didn't work at Florida for him. And, and part of that because you know, Kron got hurt and opened the door and an opportunity for for Locklear to come in and. Uh, they clearly were, you know, pleased with what he got done. And, um, and honestly, makes now now with this move makes sense as to why, when K. Ron did get hurt, they just slid Darnell to right tackle instead of bringing Marcus Tatum in at right tackle and keeping Darnell at right guard. Well, we have absolutely seen that experiment. Yes. Well, I mean that one. I mean, but, I even outlined. But Tatum's going to be your backup left tackle. Yeah. If if, if Jameer Johnson can't go, he's going to remain your backup left tackle. Particularly if Wanye has a hard time physically, he's got the he's had the ankle in the Florida game. He's had two weeks, but you know conditioning's been a bit of a concern there with him. Now they want him to play the whole game, but if he can't, then they're going to go Marcus Tatum at, at left tackle. But it, it feels like Marcus Tatum's the last tackle on the rung of tackles. Yeah, kind of where he's at right now. Um, and while they I, wait on Jameer to get back, I I mean I don't get the sense Jameer's back going to be ready to go. We haven't seen him take a practice snap right. this week. I'm interested to see with Marcus Tatum. You know, he's played the four games this year. I know he's, he's expressed some, you know, at least some thought to some people that, you know, he may look to go elsewhere. Well, you can't do that if you roll out there for a special teams snap on Saturday. So I'm interested to see how Saturday goes. You know, how, how does that one play out? Hasn't he already redshirted, though? No, but he could grad transfer. Oh, uh, yeah. Which means he can play Which all year. Which means he can play all he year. He can play all year and still grad transfer. Yeah, I guess you're right. Yeah, he could, he could do no, that. No, no, he did not redshirt. Remember, he did not redshirt. I think he redshirted as a sophomore. I think, I think, did he? What, yeah, I think he came back and got that That's right. Back. They sent him out those last four games right. when Butch was. That's right. You're yeah, right. I think, Sorry. I think they did. So he could be a grad. So the four-game thing for him is much like with JG. It didn't matter. Yeah. 
um, you know, he could play all year and still be and go as a grad transfer. And that group's going to be tested this week. The offensive the, line, the, the offensive tackles, particularly oh, the pass. I mean, the whole offensive know, line is going to be yes, tested. Yes, but 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 unlike a, Georgia did not get after the quarterback as much a year ago. They kind of played hands off and, and were more worried about not giving up big plays. Uh, but this year, I mean, it, they're, they're they're averaging three sacks a game, which is second in the SEC. Super aggressive. I mean, they're they're playing much more. Uh, upfield and they're young and, and across the line of scrimmage kind of pin your ears back and, and go now they've been in some ball games where they've had huge leads it's been easier for them to do that it's Notre, fair point. Notre it's Dame point. was was an exception to that and they still got after the quarterback I mean they were they were aggressive to me and watching them in the SEC and, and Rob you can jump in here and anybody else wants to jump in defensively and I, I've not seen Missouri admittedly but they're they're the most impressive defense in the SEC to me right now because I think their front seven is playing at a different energy level aggressiveness than than other maybe flaw maybe maybe Auburn. I was gonna say I, I think there. it's I think it's Georgia Auburn that had the best As, two defenses in the conference. The best two front sevens for yeah. sure. Yeah. Oh, I don't think there's any question. I mean, Auburn's super aggressive up front, but think about and Georgia, Auburn's more in the interior. Yeah, Georgia's Auburn. getting so much off the edge. They're not going to give you the corner at, at all, which will be a challenge. I mean, they're just really Tennessee. solid. I mean, they haven't given up big plays, and you know, I mean, Vanderbilt's not a great team, but I mean, they're you know, it's an SEC team, and, and Notre Dame, you know, I, I think is very solid. And I mean, they just have not. In addition to just being really sound, I mean, it, it's it's tough to get get an explosive play against them. Yeah, I think I mentioned this on the Tuesday podcast. The most the most eye opening thing in that Notre Dame game was them first and goal at the two, and, and they threw it four times. They didn't even try to run it. They basically just lined up there and said, "We we don't have we cannot beat their defense running the football." And against yet. a pretty good Virginia defense, the next week, you know that running back ran for like 150 yards. Right. I so mean, so says a lot about about Georgia's front seven and the challenges there. On the flip side, big challenges for Tennessee defensively. We're going to see. I think Tennessee be creative up front on the defensive front, trying to generate some pressure, trying to generate some different looks and things like that. A lot of pressure on the linebackers this week uh, because I would expect crossing routes, Jesse, getting it to Swift out of the backfield, trying to get linebackers isolated in coverage. Yeah, I would say Swift and then Cook. I wouldn't be surprised if if that's a if that's a matchup that uh, they kind of test Toa Toa there. You know, he he obviously it was more down the field perimeter stuff that he struggled at, but both he and Batuli were challenged um, in that uh, Florida game, and and certainly teams are going to take that on. You know off the film and, and try to replicate it. Yeah, interesting, Rob. I was reading some stuff with some Georgia fans, a couple of stories out there written about some some disappointment among Georgia fans because they weren't they weren't vertical enough with the passing game. They they weren't they weren't aggressive enough throwing the ball down the field. They were Fromm was being too much of a game manager and, and not you know not aggressive enough in, in the passing game. Uh, don't they lead? Don't they lead the SEC in, in average yards per play? They're right behind Alabama, but they're number four. In the, they're ahead of LSU. I mean, part of the Georgia's issue this year is they just haven't been great in the red zone. Which is, if that's how Tennessee's going to stay in the game, Georgia's going to create yardage. You know, we, uh, were they going to move the football? A little bend and not break. But force but field goals. Force some field goals, and then and then maybe you can make it a four quarter game because that has been their kind of I think kryptonite thus far this season. It happened against Vanderbilt. Happened multiple times against uh, Notre Dame where they had to settle for three instead of scoring seven. Yeah, I mean Franz was. Uh, he may not be pushing it down the field as much as Georgia fans want. But, man, he's been just super efficient. I mean, he's completing like seventy five percent of his passes. I think he's done one interception with eight touchdowns and. Uh, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think he's the most dynamic or exciting guy, but, but I, I agree with, like, everything Jeremy Pruitt was saying about him on Monday, just the way he managed, manages the game. I mean, he's, he, he's a cool operator. If, if you're Tennessee, the question Tennessee fans have, how's Tennessee going to take away the middle of the football field? That was the great divide. Because, l- look, you're, you're going to be facing play-action pass. Guys are going to bite on the run because you're worried about that, the, the Georgia run game, which has been the best part of their – offense and what they do. So how does Tennessee take away the middle of the football field, which Florida exploited as, as often and, and as many times as they wanted? Well, you're going to need better safety play. And I, and I thought you've been someone that said you, Don't you can't have – playing too deep? I was going to say you can't have – you're the one that's uh, – you can't have your safeties back. You know, Nigel Warriors sometimes isn't even in the picture. And I get not wanting to get the ball thrown over your head, but he's going to have – safety's going to have to play much closer to the line of scrimmage. 
and and they're going to have to be ready for Eli Wolf has, has had several catches, Warner, but then specifically uh, some of those seam routes to, to guys like Demetrius Robinson and some of those other – the freshman Dominique Blaylock has been heavily involved. Uh, and they're going to have to tackle. And that's kind of what no, – that's how Notre Dame stayed in the game early. They tackled on the perimeter. And, and if you can do that, again, you can kind of shorten some series and at least shorten the game a little bit. Can Tennessee line up? Put their corners on an island and take away the middle of the football field and take their chances on the outside. I, I mean, I think they'll have to, but I, I don't like that matchup. I, mean, I just think they're going to have the safety is going to have to be close to the line. For the run game. I mean, Georgia. Will well, I just don't think you can play a bunch of zone behind him because I think if you play zone, you're not going to get a lot of pressure, and Fromm's going to pick you apart that way. Almost, almost taking the chances of Fromm having an, a little bit of an off night, not being able to deliver yeah, the ball vertical down that, the field. That's what I think. I, I think that's what you do is, is you do put them on an island and hope that the crowd is into it enough early on that he starts slow, is a little rusty, and has an off night. Because, I mean, you look back to last year, the pressure they got on him. Now, I mean, they still made some plays, but he, he, he did not have a great game um, against Tennessee. Yeah, Tennessee don't have the exact same cast of guys trying to get to him this year, but, I mean – you can still find a way to make pressure. You just put your guys more on an island when you do that. I think I need Daryl Taylor to do the same thing. I mean, that was Isaiah Wilson is a is a legitimate NFL offensive lineman. You know, day two, day potential day one pick. He gave up three sacks all season. Two of them were to Taylor. So they're gonna, they're going to need DT. And DT only has one this season. You know, he met he met with us earlier this week saying that he's going to play with more effort, more relentlessness. You know. Saturday would be a good time to start. Yeah, I think Tennessee's got to create pressure and create some havoc that way because I just don't think you can sit back and play coverage against him. I, I just I, I think Fromm will, will absolutely destroy you if you're sitting back playing coverage and you know trying to you know have zone fits and, and all the passing matching combinations and everything else. I just think that I think you'll have a field day with that. So I, I think you you take your chances on them missing some plays, similar to what they did a, a year ago against Auburn. I mean, what did Auburn have? Two drop touchdowns in that game on, on deep balls that were potential game changers. They just still didn't connect. They just didn't make the play. You're going to have to have some good fortune like that if you're going to make well, this you, a 60-minute football game. Well, you hope that Bryce game. Thompson's second game is far better than his first. Well, it ought to be his third, but yes, yeah. you're exactly right. I mean, it, you, you hope that he knocked off the rust or whatever he was dealing with and that he's a little bit – his elbow's healthier and, and he's a little bit better after an open date and a chance to get back into the groove of things than he was at Florida because – you pointed this out in your review piece. He struggled as much as anybody did the secondary at Florida. Oh, yeah. yeah I mean, it, and they picked on him. Yeah. And and now Tennessee, you know, we'll see what happens with Warren Burrell, but he's a little dinged up. So both these teams, I think, are a little bit – Georgia has more depth than, than Tennessee, but both these teams may be missing the guys that they, you know, or at least one of the guys that they would be wanting to start on the outside. All right, Tennessee is in this game in the fourth quarter. How? I mean, it's got to be forcing turnovers and and I think eating clock. It's, it's, I think the way they got to be able to run the ball. You got to yeah. be able to shorten the game. That, that's time of possession. I mean, ten, turnovers, ten, turnovers for sure. But I mean, I think being able to run the ball, not just to shorten the game, but pick up some first downs. I mean, if you're doing if you're doing a lot of three and out, the way Georgia runs the football, they'll wear this defense out. I mean, just. I mean, it, they, they, they could just be – I mean, they'll be gassed by the third quarter if Tennessee punted, you know, five times in the first half. I agree with that. I, mean, I think they can wear – I think they can wear Tennessee down quickly if, if, if you're not careful. I think down. Tennessee's got to find a way to get out of the first quarter. I mean, so many, so many times in recent years, Tennessee has had this negative play early that has just Good point. rocked them in these type of games. Well, I think, think about it. I mean, Florida, a year ago, turnover, turnover, boom, out of the game. I mean, Georgia look, State to open the season, boom, first yeah, possession. Man, last year, Georgia, <laughs> you forced a fumble and tied in, picked it up, ran in for a touchdown. Yeah. I mean, you know, little things like that, dude, they just, you know, yeah. had a huge effect. I mean, you, you've got to have help, no, no question. I'm with you. I think surviving – because I think there's a little bit, and, and, and Prude has talked about this without specifically saying it, in terms of being comfortable with losing. I don't know that that's right. I do think there's a little bit of, well, here we go again on this team with some of the, some of the veteran guys. And the young guys don't know any different, okay, because it's hard. But I, I think there's, there's been some, and, and I think, you know, Jared's guilty of this, a little bit of something bad happened, here we go again. And, and Tennessee has got to survive early you know, get this thing to the half, make it a football game to, to try to be in it, you know, in the second half. And to do that, 
they've got to have some good fortune early, and they can't get blitzed right out of the gate. They got to make Georgia frustrated. Yeah, and, and there's the, and the, and the thing is, I think one of the most overrated thing, all this familiarity, and there's plenty of people have written. So I, I think that's both these teams know what's coming, and it's going to be about you know we've heard the word execution a million times for the first month, but that is what's going to be happening Saturday. So can Tennessee execute well enough to survive the first quarter? And get that into a second half game. We'll see. Yeah, because I, I mean, you know, people are like, "Well, does Tennessee have an advantage?" Because Cheney knows everything. Well, I mean, everybody knows everybody, and it's the it's there, yeah. There's some differences in personnel in the system, but it's very similar defensively what they're trying to do. And Georgia hadn't deviated a lot from what they were doing with Jim Cheney offensively. I mean, these guys know each other all too well. It, it is going to go back to execution. Can Tennessee execute early? Can they get settled into the football game and sort of catch their breath and, 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 and breathe and play? I don't know. That That's, to me, the biggest case for anything. I mean, I, th- <clears throat> I think we all agree Georgia's going to win this game. I mean, so in, in light of that, what what does what does improvement look like? Throw the scoreboard out the window. What what do we need to see to, th- to feel like Tennessee's getting better? I, I wrote it on Thursday, and this is, this is very um, – <laughs> This is very disheartening for Tennessee fans to read because it's been a narrative on and off for the last 10 years. But Tennessee's got to make it a 60-minute fight. They got to be in the ball game for 60 minutes. I mean, I know that's sad to say, but you're at home. You're a three-touchdown underdog. Nobody's giving you a chance. Try to be, try to be in the fourth quarter. Try to be in the ball game in the fourth quarter. You look at Vanderbilt blitzed in the second half. wasn't a, wasn't a sixty minute football game a year ago. Neither was Missouri. So you're saying neither was saying Florida. Get to the fourth quarter ten or less, or fourteen or less, or what? But get in the fourth quarter where Georgia's sweating and not playing, not playing every walk on on the roster. I mean, to, to me, that, I, that, I agree that, with that's. That. And look, was Georgia going to lose that game last year? No, I, I don't think they were. But but they dropped an early screen pass that would have gone for a score probably in the first quarter on a good play call by cap- Cheney. Tennessee capitalized on some of those mistakes, they, absolutely. And so in the fourth quarter early, Tennessee does have a third and four where they you know, can't get off the field there, but it was a 25-12 game. Okay. You, Can you do that again? You're at least making somebody worry a little bit. Yeah. You just haven't made people worry enough. And, and Florida wasn't worried. 17 nothing at the half. Nobody going to the concession stand at Florida Field thought, boy, this is a really critical start to the second half here, this first possession. Nobody thought Tennessee was going to score 17 points and come and back and beat And that was Florida not even playing that well. No, nah, <laughs> and with, with a quarterback who had played very little, and you're right, had not played particularly well. So I, I, I think, think, I think that, the other takeaway, my other takeaway would be, if we're talking about hypotheticals, we spent a lot of time on the quarterback, if you feel like, all right, regardless of the scoreboard, if you feel like you have a good idea of what your quarterback position is and you've developed will look an, like moving You've developed forward. an offensive identity, something about this is, who you, this is who you are, this is what you can, this is what you can build on moving forward. Because let, let's go back to the game. I mean, Georgia State was just bad, okay, turned it over, didn't have any idea what Tennessee was. BYU, yeah, they ran the ball wide effectively, but we all sat here and said, that's fool's goal because you're not going to do that against the SEC. So you've played four games, and you've not come out of one of those games where you say, you know what, that, that's, that's who they're becoming offensively. Yeah, you're right. I mean, ran for 50-odd yards at Florida. I mean, so I, I think, I think his, his point, as well as making it a 60-minute fight, I would agree with. If you can come out of the game and say, hey, you can build off of these two or three things, Austin, heading into Mississippi State, making it a winnable football game, South Carolina a winnable football game. I think that's probably a win for Tennessee, regardless of the score. Yeah, I agree. I mean, you know, I, I think for this offense, if if Maurer goes out and, and just kind of, whether he plays well or not, if he gets the command of the of the guys around him and, and he can make, you know, Jeremy's always talking about making the other guys around you better. If, if he can, even if it's incrementally, on Saturday, I think that goes a long way to end of the next week against Mississippi State, which you know can be a winnable game for Tennessee. It's a huge loss for Tennessee, regardless of the scoreboard. If we're having a conversation on Tuesday about who should be the starting quarterback at Tennessee, I agree. If you haven't found some answer there by week five, if it's if it's open competition now, is it going to be you know they going to change you know quarterbacks? I mean, if, if you don't come out of this game with this is who we are. Who this is who we're going to be offensively from an identity standpoint, and this is our trigger man. This is our quarterback. Then I think that's I think that's worse than getting blown out in the scoreboard. 
you know, I've been, Georgia. I've been saying Because I don't think it gives you a chance to win against Mississippi State or South Carolina if you're still trying to figure out what you are offensively and who you're, and who your you know, personnel is offensively. I, yeah, my, own, my, my only counter to that would be the, what if you end up having to play both freshmen and that's the way you roll? Like that is that is that could that qualify as an identity? If you say, all right, we're definitely moving on from number two, we're gonna basically that we're say, not gonna know who we're not gonna know who our quote unquote guy is until maybe South Carolina. It's like three, you know. I just got, think I think somebody's got to give you some hope coming out of this game, especially I, if you're gonna go this route. Yeah, if if you're you gonna know. go when you're gonna if if you're gonna shelf your veteran guy, then then I think one of those two freshmen has to give you. Some okay, this is going to be a guy we can build around. And, I, and I've been saying a lot, you know, right now, I don't think Tennessee's really got a quarterback because nobody's shown you enough to, you know, prove that, you know, they have somebody that can be a consistent playmaker. But if you, if you change how you, you approach the game and you call plays to, let's say, Brian Maurer's strengths, that's not to say that Maurer can't go out there and be very effective. And all of a sudden, it does change and they do have a quarterback. But to this point, that's been like where they've been so far behind their opponent, it's not even funny. So, you know, if you're Jim Cheney, again, this is why you get paid $1.5 million, you know, getting whoever you stick out there, if that's Maurer, putting him in the best you know, position to be successful, calling plays that are to his strengths, whether that's check with me, a lot of RPOs, or whatever else. Um, you know, I, I think you've got to be able to walk out of this game, you know, feeling like, okay, we have somebody we can build around. And, and right now, I don't think there is a guy to this point. I agree with that. That's why I think that's important to say success in this game. All right, let's get to recruiting right quick. I know we're going to have a shell on this uh, with names in the war room. We're going to have more on, on Saturday, kind of who's projected to be here. What, what's, the, what's the big storyline in recruiting for Tennessee for this weekend? Well, I, had it in, kids? Well, I, I had it in the war room. I, I just think that the, the tenor of the weekend has changed in terms of it was supposed to be the big fish. This was, if you looked at it, a month ago, six weeks ago, they wanted it to be a night game. What is a night game? They wanted it, you know, this to be the marquee recruiting weekend. Well, it's still pretty darn important. It's just, di- it's just different. And instead, it's they have, they're going all in on this in-state crop. And by hosting three kids from the same high school in Memphis, all on official visits, also getting Amari Thomas tentatively on campus for an unofficial visit, Reggie Grimes, who you're trailing South Carolina, you can't just punt. No matter that, I know there's disagreements within the building here about, you know, what position does he play upside. What Tennessee needs more athletes like Reggie Grimes on their team. So they're going all in on on the in-state guys, and they need to make a good impression this weekend, regardless of what happens on the scoreboard. So I, the, I, the the three Whitehaven kids, French, Eason, are, are, and McDonald are all coming. Bri- you know, huge priorities. Amari Thomas, if he gets here, huge priority for Tennessee and Grimes. The, the five in-state guys well, yeah, and be here, the tenor. Here's the thing. If you're Arkansas and, and, and Mississippi State, you're just trying to survive the weekend because Tennessee's shooting their shot with three officials. You know, I mean, they're going to lay it on, lay it on thick, and, and you know. And this I mean, is the first one for all of them. They're all still going to Arkansas. Yeah, they're all, they're all going to – they're but they're going to try hard to – It's an interesting play to, to, to get them all – I mean, that's all well, you can get them here, I'm sure. Well – you know they are off, and I think that goes a long way to this. Because you can get them here when, early. When they on have Friday. their regular bye week. I don't think Tennessee's at home. Right. And so um, they do have a bye week, or a, just uh, we're starting to be a bye week. It's just an off week because no one was going to get ten games. And having an official on a game week where they play on Friday night means you're not getting them here till Saturday, and they have a shorter trip because they're getting back out of here on Sunday. Yeah. Because you can't fly them in privately after their game or anything like that. You're not going to fly in from Memphis at 11:30 at night because you can't get that flight. So that that makes a, a lot of sense uh, in, in that regard. There, they're also going to have the Simpson kid in. He tweeted out. Ty Simpson will be in town. I know um, it's early for him, but getting him on campus is important as many times as they can. His dad's got the ties to Mississippi State. You're looking for a bell cow quarterback well, recruit, here, I believe. Right. You're looking for a bell cow quarterback recruit in the class of 2022, and he would <laughs> he would be the one, right? Yeah. No. There's no doubt. I mean, to me, like Tennessee's not produced a top shelf quarterback in the state, and. You know, whatever, Ever. 25 years at least. I Long mean, time. like, you know, and all of a sudden you've got a guy that could potentially be the, the top quarterback in the country, if not a top five quarterback in the country. You have t- to find a way to, to, you know, get in early and stay in there and, and land this kid. Whoever, you know, no matter what happens with the program, you know, the, whoever it is has got to land him. Yeah, you got, he's got, he is a huge priority for Tennessee. So a lot of things going on in recru- football recruiting, football on the weekend, uh, and then, 
Um, yeah, I guess we need to circle back to that, Jesse. Um, we'll get to basketball in just a second. We, we had not touched the, the, the Jeremy Banks situation and the Jeremy Banks deal with, with, with Tennessee and, and all that happened with that. Uh, just quickly in the kind of summation of that, we had a little bit of it in the war room. We talked about it some on the message board. Just a bad look for Tennessee. Uh, Jeremy Pruitt saying on Wednesday on the teleconference, you know, from an organizational standpoint, they have to do a better job of knowing all these things are going on. Um, just nothing about that is a positive look for Tennessee. Should have suspended him. Why didn't you? I don't think we're ever going to get an answer from Jeremy Pruitt on that. Um, I don't know. I mean, I mean, I think you're taking a PR hit. Him. And you're gonna, yeah. I mean, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna keep. I don't want to say keep taking it. It'll go away, but it's been an ugly PR hit it's, for you this I mean, week. It's been horrible. And, I mean, the, what makes it worse, I mean, you kind of touched on it, is totally unavoidable. I mean, it was totally avoidable. I mean, it should have never – something that could have been handled with absolutely no fuss whatsoever, it blows up and, you, you know, it becomes the biggest – Thing that you've been, I mean, you got you know, the biggest thing you've been known for this whole. You got season. ten. You got ten thousand people on staff here, and a million. And this is why you have ops people. You know, this is why you have folks that behind the scenes, it's their jobs to 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 kind of have their p's and q's on all this stuff. And like Rob said, it was avoidable. What what Banks said was particularly ugly. You know, Jeremy was clearly half asleep and, and yeah. what, what, what did not understand, was clearly confused, took out his frustrations, uh, and didn't, was not a great look. But the, the bad look is Tennessee, A, not being prepared for that in the first place. And then the fact that, that what Banks said was just despicable and, and was a poor representative representation of the university, especially coming on the heels of what happened with a couple Bryce weeks Thompson. ago with Bryce Thompson. And then, of course, you go back to the Kenneth George thing at spring break. And, you know, I mean, it, it, you're right. It's not a good look. Um, you know, I, I go back to the – you know, we've talked about this. I mean, once Jeremy Banks injured his ankle before the Florida game, the smart play would have been just to – Get out in front of it and get suspend him and say that, hey, <laughs> yeah. we, we, uh, there's a video that's going to come out. There's going to be some ugly things that are said. We find it unacceptable. He's suspended. And we're going to learn yeah, from this can, and move on. You could have just said violation of team rules, and then yeah. when this video comes out, then you look like you were yeah. being proactive. Exactly. You know, people were like, oh, well, that's what he was suspended yeah. for. Yeah. I mean, yeah. The, the, the and only instead, way, you're fighting on your heels about right, it. Right. The only way to get out in front of it would have, would have been to suspend him, which I think we all agree he should have been suspended. If, if you come out and say the statements you said before the video comes out and you haven't suspended him, you look bad too. Oh, I mean, for sure, I agree. With you know, that. I, I think I think the look bad, the bad look here is 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 threefold. One, Banks looks bad because of the way he handled himself. Tennessee looks bad because they were unorganized to Jeremy Pruitt's own admission that they didn't know what was going on there. And three, Tennessee looks bad because their response to it is in-house punishment yeah. after and the it fact. Just, it just really the whole episode just reflects poorly on the, on the culture of your football program. When and like AP said, when you when you bracket it with you know the Bryce Thompson thing a couple of weeks ago, and then Kenneth George, and just and everybody forgets about that one. I mean, and it's just, I mean these are the big, these are the biggest headlines you've made as a as a football program. Well, and these are the headlines you're going to have to address in recruiting. You know, I mean, you you, you know, you're not you got enough issues in recruiting that a one in three start and not being competitive. You don't. You don't need to do these. You don't need to have these types of things to make. Yeah, you think some mama's not asking an assistant coach about you know, hey, what was what was all that about? Right, because it's, it's going to be hard to sell. Yeah, hey, I that, got your I got your back. Is that what is that you what know? the locker is that you know is that indicative of the kind of locker room you, well, you've got why, up there? Why was I mean, we're getting texts from players' parents about that? You know, as we speak. I mean, there, there's what? plenty of people asking those right. very questions that are on the team currently standing. Why Why didn't somebody help him handle this? He didn't. And you know, he didn't I mean, know this type of thing. He didn't know what he needed to do. Remember, last like night, I mean, one of the first things I thought of, and it was because I mean, because, because of what you wrote on Tuesday. I mean, just this is the complete opposite of like this. Is, if Judy Jackson was here, I mean. Some or somebody like that. It's a. I mean, you just Gerald. You never saw things like this happen. Well, that, and I think that's something that that Philip Fulmer and Jeremy Pruitt certainly have to look at and address immediately, and f and figure out why there's why there was a crack, loophole, things falling through, and, and and clean that up by whatever means necessary that that you have to do that. So, um, like I said, it'll pass from a from a you know, storyline standpoint, but there's, as Jesse pointed out in the tweet, there's a lot to learn there. The question, you know, you got to make sure if you're Tennessee that you learn what you need to learn from this to prevent 
something like this from ever happening again. As we get out the door and wrap it up right quick, huge weekend for basketball tonight. Fans can see this team, Rob, and they can also, with some recruits in the house, opportunity tonight uh, to be around this basketball team, a basketball team that continues to generate some buzz, and a huge weekend for them yeah, with Jaden Springer. Jaden Springer, um, you know, two big-time commitments already in the fold, and Corey Walker and Keon Johnson, both those guys will be on campus this weekend. Um, you know, I, I, that's a positive move by Tennessee. Normally, you wouldn't bring three guys in on an official visit for, ba for a basketball weekend, but, you know, Tennessee has the luxury. Of two of these dudes are commitments. They don't have to babysit them. They don't have to – you know, make sure mama feels like she's getting enough attention, all that. I mean, these guys are in. The whole reason they're coming is to, you know, convince Jaden Springer to jump in the boat. And I've been saying it for a long time now. I think, I think Tennessee is pretty clearly the team to beat. This is, the, this is his last official visit, and I would be surprised to see him make a decision pretty quickly on the heels of, of coming into town. We'll see what happens with that. We'll follow all that for you, follow football recruiting as well as this football team. That's going to do it for this Friday edition of the VolQuest.com podcast. For Jesse Simonton, Rob Lewis, and Austin Price, I'm Brent Hubbs. Thanks for joining us. Have a great weekend, everybody.